Aurangzeb was a great Sufi. <laughs> People have started arguing. Okay. Yes, that he was a great Sufi. Okay. You know, I Hema mean, was Razia. But you know, the <laughs> thing is, I mean, that's. <laughs> don't tell me this. <laughs> I don't want to remember that. Yeah. But I never saw the movie mercifully. Okay. There is one class of Indians that is like that. Yes. And yes. there is another class that is going on. Mm. So now this temple was destroyed. I can't tell. <laughs> Sorry about that. No. Muhammad Ghani's general Kutubuddin Ahmed, who later becomes the first Sultan of Delhi. Yes. So in the attack on Kashi, the Persian historians who accompany him write that. He destroyed one thousand temples. One thousand temples. So this philosophy, that Atma and Brahma are one, hmm. that God is within us, hmm. this is something that now you know every Indian, I think, yes, has become so imbued with this philosophy. Doctor Minakshi Janji, welcome back to the podcast. Always a pleasure to have you. Such a delight to be here, and before you proceed, I have to thank you for such a powerful platform that you have created, and it has given me access to so many viewers and readers. And I also have to thank the awesome audience. Absolutely, the way they welcome the podcast, their suggestions, even their criticisms had so much for me to think about. so i have to be really thankful to them and to you i am uh, i'm most you were most welcome i think the audience watches because it is luminaries like you who come on the podcast no, so i also have to thank you that's very kind of you <laughs> so we're going to discuss uh, your book vishwanath rises and rises i still haven't had the pleasure of reading it so could you please explain what it is about we'll start with what the book is about and then we can delve into the deeper issues yeah Uh, so actually, uh, I wrote the book by accident. Okay. To be very frank, mm. uh, I had written two books on Ayodhya. Yes. Followed by one book on Mathura. Mm -hmm. Then so many people, you know, they would come to me and say, "The VHP and the Hindus asked for only three temples. You've written only two books. <laughs> <laughs> so please don't be so unfair to Kashi." Okay. So I thought that there is merit in this mm. argument, and I started working on Kashi. Okay. Uh, my book was uh, ready uh, by uh, winter last year. Okay. Then suddenly, something unexpected happened. Mm -hmm. The Varanasi High Court gave the Archaeological Survey of India permission to investigate at the site of Gyan Vapi. Rather un unexpected. Totally unexpected, yes. considering the fact that you know in Ayodhya. Mm. it had been dragging on and on and on so long yeah and uh, the excavations were done and in 2007 mm -hmm. on the orders of the allahabad high court mm -hmm. and the allahabad high court judgment came in 2010 the supreme court verdict in 2019 mm -hmm. so it was such a long thing yes so uh, then i thought of oh, this is totally i think maybe vishwanath is blessing me so <laughs> i said i must wait uh -huh. uh, for the report Okay. For the excavations. The excavations. Okay. And lo and behold, the moment the excavations were over, the court said release the report. Incredible. <laughs> <laughs> never, it was never seen before. Never seen before. Yes. So I said, you know, this is a sign mm. that I did the right thing. I took up Kashi, did not abandon it, mm. and uh, you know, Vishwanath has blessed. Mm. The report has come. It has been made public. Mm -hmm. So the last chapter is on. This ASI report. Okay, so you incorporated that. Yes, naturally, okay, naturally. because the book was ready bef three, four months before that. Yes. So I said it makes no sense to. So it's absolutely up to date. Mm. Now you asked. I mean, I've told you why I wrote the yes. book because of the historic circumstances. But what is it that struck me most mm. about uh, Kashi when I wrote the book? Mm -hmm. You know, we have our mind and our hearts, if I can put it. that way have been so overwhelmed mm -hmm. by the tragic circumstances that started in the 10th 11th century yes so you know that has occupied our minds and consciousness mm. and we have i think to a man and woman almost forgotten that there is a glorious kashi thousands of years before that yes 
which we also have to relate, relate to and reclaim. Mm -hmm. See, the point is that the Hindu civilizational recovery, I mean, it has picked up pace mm -hmm. in the recent years. Yes. But there's still a long way to go. Indeed. And I realize this because, you know, like many other Hindus, uh, I was only worried about the attacks that began in the 11th century uh -huh. and how they totally devastated Kashi. Yes. We will come to that little later. Okay. But I then recalled in the course of my research that Kashi, what was the importance of Kashi in the Hindu spiritual philosophical journey? Mm -hmm. And that is, I mean, this was there at the back of my mind, but you know, you don't uh, really come to grips with it until you start writing it. Okay. <clears throat> See, uh, the earliest uh, texts, uh, whether you can call them spiritual or whatever, mm. they were the Vedas. Yes. And the setting of the Vedas are commonly accepted by scholars as Northwestern India and Punjab. Yes. So, the uh, Vedas don't show much uh, awareness of the land beyond that. Yes, eastwards. And what was, yes, hmm. and what was the highlight of the Vedas? It was yagyas. Yes. You sacrifice, so you create those elaborate yagyas, uh, which are very meticulously documented, you know, how it has to be created. Yes. And then you offer sacrifice and Agni carries your offering to the deities above. Yes. So, it was very, very meticulous. Mm -hmm. Uh, but the problem uh, with the Vedic Yagyas was that, you know, it could be practiced only by a few because it was such elaborate rituals. Yes. And uh, a large section of the populace uh, was kept outside this. Mm -hmm. It was not deliberate, but it just so happened. Yeah. So, this was the first step in the Hindu civilizational journey. Yes. Now, a quantum leap takes place when we shift the uh, location to eastern India mm. and principally Kashi and Videha. Mm -hmm. Videha, we all know, was the land famous for King Janak, mm -hmm. father of Sita. Yes. Kashi and Videha occupied a very, very important place because they were the harbingers of a new leap in the civilizational journey. Mm -hmm. So, as the Rig Vedas or the Vedas were concerned with Yajna, yeah. in Kashi and Videha, we have kings, kings mm -hmm. articulating a new philosophy. And what is that philosophy? That philosophy that the kings enunciated has now, over the millennia percolated to each and every inhabitant of this land. Mm -hmm. And that is Atma and Brahma are one. God is within us, you know. Yes. So, this philosophy, Tattvam Asi, yes. this, the Brihad Ranya Upanishad, the Chandog Upanishad, mm -hmm. these were among the Upanishads that articulated this. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, according to the uh, material that we find in the Upanishads, the kings, Janak and uh, 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 and the king of Kashi, they are the ones who are initiating this dialogue. Mm. And they call people to their courts. Uh -huh. And many people come. And uh, there, you know, they say to the kings that we did not know this knowledge. And we want to learn this knowledge from you. Mm -hmm. So, the kings say that actually it is not the job of kings to educate Brahmins. Because yes. the Brahmins are coming to their court and the kings are Kshatriyas. But they say, we will enunciate you in this new philosophy. Okay. So, this philosophy that Atma and Brahma are one, hmm. that God is within us. Hmm. This is something that now, you know, every Indian, I think, yes. has become so imbued with this philosophy. Yes. So, this is such a, you know, now the Vedic Yagyas, they are, uh, you know, a part of the home rituals that one does. Hmm. 
there are no elaborate yagyas mostly. Anymore. Yes. Anymore. Yeah. So made those hmm. Vedic yagyas have actually become a small ritual that we practice at home. Hmm. But what was enunciated in Kashi and Videha is what has become the abiding landmark and feature of Indian philosophy, hmm. spiritual journey. And this is something that we have all forgotten because what happened afterwards was so traumatic. Yes. Now, my argument is that when we talk about reclaiming Kashi, yes. our reclamation should not stop at 1080. Okay. That is when the Turkish invasions began. Yes. We have to go much, much beyond that mm -hmm. and capture and reclaim the grandeur. Yes. The 11th century was a period of diminution. Yes. And destruction. Indeed. And uh, it, it traumatized us. Mm -hmm. But the millennia before that was a tremendous period of glory, learning, experimentation, debates, free society. Yes. And you know, we have to uh, try to get, recapture that glory rather than I'm not saying that we have not to reclaim what happened 1000 years ago, mm -hmm. but I'm saying to confine ourselves to that is a partial reclamation of a grand heritage. Indeed, yes. So uh, this is the first uh, uh, part of my book. Okay. And uh, then, you know, uh, Kashi is so totally associated with Shiv. Yes. So, you know, uh, how does Shiv come to Kashi? Okay. So, I have narrated those stories that, you know, uh, his wife Parvati, huh. uh, her mother says that, you know, I am not very happy with the person you have married. Yes. And nor do, am I happy with the place where he lives. Mm. So, Parvati says, you know, let us find something uh, more appropriate to my mother's tastes. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, if I can put it that way. Mm -hmm. So, then they come and they see Kashi mm -hmm. and uh, Shiv says that, I will never leave Kashi. Okay. So, you know, uh, and the important thing about Indian history, uh, which I begin to appreciate more and more, is that, you know, myths or mythologies mm -hmm. are actually representing or memory, uh, in remembrance of a fact that actually happened. Yes. So, uh, you know, uh, we all have this myth that Ganga came down. Yes. Ganga came down because there was King Bhagirath. Hmm. He could not perform the last rituals of his ancestors because there was no water. Mm -hmm. So, he appeals to Ganga that please descend from Devlok mm -hmm. because she says, if I descend, there will be destruction. Yes. So, uh, please ask Shiv to uh, catch me in his locks. locks and then the destructive impact will be reduced. Yes. So, Bhagirath request Shiv, Shiv catches Ganga in her, in his locks mm -hmm. and she comes. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, actually, uh, you know, uh, scientists mm -hmm. who uh, studied the uh, geological formations around Kashi, mm -hmm. they said that around 7000 BC, okay. some uh, movement uh, of the, you know, soil or earth took place. Okay. And as a result, water came. Okay. Ganga came. I Ganga see. was not flowing near Kashi before that. I see. So, you know, that movement of Ganga into <clears throat> Kashi, which is a fact that has been attested by scientists, hmm. has been captured so beautifully in this myth. In this myth. In this, it, it's not a myth, but what a story. What appears to be a myth, yes. A legend. Yes. So, you know, uh, people say that Hindus were a, a historical people. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I always marvel mm. at the way they remembered. Mm. They didn't remember history the way we write it, mm -hmm. obviously. Mm -hmm. But they remembered history in such a beautiful way that, you know, everyone could relate to that event. It was accessible to the commonest of people. To the commonest of people. Yes. So, uh, that is uh, the second part. Okay. Uh, then, you know, when, uh, what is the earliest Puranic references to what's happening in Kashi, to okay. the arrival of Shiv in Kashi, etc. Hmm. So, the Skand Puran. Okay. 
and and you know there are two uh, professors abroad they have managed to get the earliest palm leaf manuscript of the skand puran mm -hmm. dated 810 ce in nepal in nepal okay so mm -hmm. now they have started working on that earliest a uh, um, you know text that is available mm -hmm. and they've published part of it so okay. that is also very very fascinating so this is being this work is being done uh, being, being done abroad yes okay uh, but uh, a, a part of it has already been published okay. i've used a uh, part of it in my okay. book okay it's a very very fascinating work which has taken into account such a vast array of sources mm -hmm. but the, of course the most important is the palm leaf manuscript which they found in nepal mm -hmm. it's very surprising that many of these original texts mm -hmm. the earliest manuscripts are available in palm leaf in nepal okay so it shows that there was such a close interaction mm -hmm. Uh, between Nepal and India. Well, Nepal is a, is a kind of a new country yeah. historically, but it was of, one. Yeah. Uh, but it, you know, it's very mm. interesting to yes. how we have divided. We have div we see things from today's perspective. <laughs> perspective. Yes, divided perspective. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, great India was great India. Yes. Yes. So uh, that is. Uh, uh, then shall I continue the story? Please do. Ma'am. So, uh, what are the earliest? archaeological evidence that we have okay because what we have discussed so far is a textual evidence yes all right yeah. vedas upanishads hmm. etc yes. skand puran etc uh, but as a historian uh, one wants to look at the actual hard evidence hard evidence yes so the hard evidence uh, actually it begins by accident okay uh, in uh, 1940 i think okay uh, the kashi railway line hmm. had to be expanded okay so workers were employed to dig you know mm -hmm. the new track and when they were digging they came across many artifacts okay uh, which they found very you know they meant something but they were not sure what they meant mm -hmm. so it was taken to the ancient india history department at bhu okay. banaras hindu university uh -huh. and the first preliminary uh, study was done and that first preliminary study showed a pillared hall i mean it is amazing that there was a i mean it was like a temple room you know okay so but uh, because it was a preliminary thing uh, further excavations were required and mm. they were carried out okay. in very great detail uh -huh. by uh, the bhu department okay so the first uh, initial investigation showed that there was a pillared hall over there how deep was this uh, i don't know how deep it was okay but uh, after that the second excavations mm -hmm. showed that okay now uh, what the excavation first of all the excavations took back the antiquity mm -hmm. of kashi uh, you know uh, 8000 bc or something 8000 bc a pillared uh, hall from 8000 bc so uh, <laughs> No, I don't know whether the pillared hole but was there. But some artifacts. But the <clears throat> antiqu the excavation showed okay. the antiquity of Kashi, and mm. uh, it showed that uh, you know Kashi was always having a religious dimension. Okay, always. Always. Okay. So the first, uh, I mean, there were three sections, mm. three parts of Kashi: mm. Sarnath, okay. Akta. and varanasi okay and all three had a distinct religious orientation okay sarnath we know later on became identified with gautam buddha yeah much later yeah much later mm -hmm. and uh, the other uh, two places we find that they were on the route and they were used by rishis okay going from the himalaya regions to the middle ganga area I see. so it, you know it's a constant movement of rishis which is why some uh, places it is called rishi patam rishi patam okay so you know because the constant movement mm -hmm. of rishis uh, so that is uh, what we find and uh, we uh, they, they found around 400 seals okay uh, you know from that rajput uh, that uh, rajghat plateau that was the oldest part of varanasi mm -hmm. so in the excavations they found around 400 seals i see uh the seals uh, were from the earliest times 
till the Gupta period and beyond. Okay. And they were very fascinating uh, because many of the seals had the emblem of Shiva. Okay. You know, the bull uh -huh. or the trident. Yes, yes. And even Maheshwar written on it. I see. So, and then there were many which were devoted to Vishnu. So, mm. they had the Pad, the Chakra, Shank, etc. Okay. So, these uh, two were very well represented in Kashi. Mm. And what was even more interesting was that many of the seals were seals of schools. Okay. Schools means they were specializing in branches of Vedic knowledge. I see. So, every school was specializing in a certain branch of Vedic knowledge and that uh, seal depicted which branch, it stated which branch they were specializing in. I see. So, you know, uh, what a glorious city it was. Yes. Hmm. That, you know, uh, such early finds of revered deities of Hinduism mm -hmm. till today mm -hmm. and being a center of Vedic learning. Education. Education. Yeah. And, you know, this, uh, the seals depict you know, mm. that is so uh, the more you explore this early history, mm. uh, the more enchanted you are uh, that uh, I mean, I'm not an abashed admirer of Indian civilization, but I don't think there's any harm in being an, an abashed admirer. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying that as a scholar, mm. I feel, you know, so inspired. Yes. At the continuity mm, yes. that uh, from such early times. Cultural continuity, civilizational cultural, continuity. Cultural and civilizational continuity. Yes. And uh, then of course, you know, uh, there are, uh, we have references to various dynasties which are ruling. Okay. Over there. Uh -huh. uh, small, small information that we have. Inscriptions. Some, uh, you know, like Bimbisar, he goes to, they are devotees of uh, Buddha. Uh -huh. So, they are going to meet him. Mm. You know, those are depictions. Okay, depictions of yeah, these events. Uh, of a little later period. Okay. And uh, Ajat Shutru going. Uh, so, you know, there are, because, uh, you know, a lot of it was depicted on uh, stupas later on. Uh -huh. So, uh, there is a lot of... Uh, I mean, depiction of these incidents uh -huh. in stupas. Uh, inscriptions, I think the earliest is uh, what is called the Varanasi inscription. Okay. And uh, that is talking about a uh, place for Vishnu. Mm -hmm. Then we have another inscription also of Vishnu. Uh, and to show you the diversity, we have an 8th century long inscription, which is talking about uh, goddess worship. Goddess worship. So, you know, I mean, it's it's not that uh, it was just uh, close to any other group. Mm -hmm. Everyone uh, was there represented. In Varanasi. And contributing. <clears throat> okay. So, you have Shiva, we have Vishnu, we also have goddess worship. Yeah. And much more, I'm sure. Yeah. Hmm. And of course, since it was uh, attacked so many times, yes. a lot of the remains are now kept in the Bharat Kala Bhavan, okay. which is part of BHU. Okay. So, it has a fabulous collection of remnants of Kashi. I see. You know? Mm -hmm. So, uh, it is really uh, absolutely uh, amazing mm -hmm. city it was. Mm -hmm. And apart from the fact that, you know, it uh, attracted foreigners okay. right from the beginning. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, you know, it was recognized by people outside India that somehow it represents the heart of Hinduism. Okay. So, uh, you know, of course, we have Yun Sang coming. Yes. And then after that, uh, we have a whole lot of travelers whom I have discussed in my book. Mm -hmm. And even after the devastations, mm -hmm. uh, foreigners recognize that it is where Hinduism lives. Mm -hmm. And we cannot understand India until we go to Varanasi. Mm -hmm. So, the early... Englishmen who came, okay. they go to Kashi mm -hmm. and it continues right till, you know, uh, Mark Twain came. Mark Twain, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and they talk about how it was such a grand civilization and uh, Bishop Heber and Bishop Shering, they write so movingly that, you know, when Europe was uh, just struggling uh, to gain its bearings, yeah. Kashi was already 
such a revered old place. Yes. So these, you know, even uh, all kinds of people who come, they are cognizant of the uh, the antiquity, hmm. the grandeur, hmm. and the place of Kashi, unparalleled with any other city. Hmm. So this is broadly uh, my early introductions. Okay. Now, uh, shall I? Please do. Please do. So the real history, which concerns and interests all of us, yes, is what happens. Now, one more thing I would like to say yes. uh, before I come to the 11th century, mm -hmm. uh, that you know, in this period, just before the 11th century, the political center of North India was Kanauj. Kanauj. And, uh, you know, uh, whoever controlled Kanauj was regarded as the master of North India. Okay. So, we have a series of battles between, for example, Palas, Pratiharas, Rashtrakutas hmm. to get the imperial city of Kanauj. Mm -hmm. So, this is an important departure okay. from where I will continue the story. Correct. That the political center of North India and the most important imperial city was Kanauj. Kanauj. And then what happens? Mm -hmm. Then we have uh, the invasions yes. which begin. Uh, so, Mahmud Ghaznavi uh, does not attack, his son attacks. Okay. Uh, so, his son attacks, but you know, uh, the Persian historians, they documented everything because for them it was an act of great glory. Yes. So, everything had to be uh, meticulously recorded. Uh -huh. So, they say that, you know, he came, but he could stay in Kashi only for a few hours okay. because of the fear that the people will rise. Okay. So, they come, that uh, sun comes for a few hours, loots and then walks away. So, that was just a uh, plunder? Plunder. Okay. But uh, when we say plunder, we should not, we should be careful to recognize mm -hmm. that it was not just a case of plunder, the religious motivation was always paramount. Indeed. Okay. Mm. So, next uh, attack takes place the following year. Okay. That also is minimal. Okay. No, minimal no massive in, destruction yet. No. Hmm. But can you imagine mm -hmm. the response of the political leadership of India? Mm -hmm. We have the rise of a, f a dynasty, the Gahadwalas. Okay. They had their capital in Kanauj. Okay. But then they relocate from Kanauj to Kashi. Okay. Because they say that religion is under threat. Mm. So they, can you imagine the foresight of, they did not know what was going to be lying ahead. Mm. The devastations which followed, they had not seen. Yes. But these two attacks made, alerted them mm. that things are changing. Mm. And we have to respond. Okay. So, they, it's something that is so difficult to, you know, uh, really, I mean, to uh, uh, accept even now that somebody could be so farsighted. Uh -huh. So, they come to Kashi and they issue charters. Okay. And they say that we are the protectors of holy cities in northern India. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know? The worst has yet to come mm. and they've already declared mm. that we are the protectors of Ayodhya, Kashi, Prayag. Okay. So, many of those charters have survived. Okay. And the first king of the Gahadwal dynasty, Chandradev, he goes to Ayodhya mm -hmm. and then he comes to Kashi. Okay. And in Kashi, he sets up an image of Keshav. Okay. So, this is the new political elite that is coming into prominence in India in the 11th century. Okay. And this uh, dynasty uh, was a very remarkable dynasty. Uh, I'll take up uh, one or two other kings of this dynasty. Okay. Chandra, uh, Govind Chandra. Govind Chandra. Yeah. He led from the front mm -hmm. and he also revived, you know, he went to various kunds, temples, mm -hmm. all those records are there. Okay. And he is also mentioned, by the way, in the inscription that fell off when Babri Masjid was demolished, uh -huh. the Vishnu Hari inscription. Okay. So, that inscription mentions that 
the person who was a feudatory of Govind Chandra. Okay. So, you know, and uh, then uh, this Govind Chandra, he is remembered. It's very difficult to imagine such a ruler existed. Mm -hmm. He levies a tax on his people, mm -hmm. Turushk Dand. Turushk Dand, okay. Punishment that you have to pay because we have to defend you from Turks. Okay. So, uh, we have heard of Jazia being collected by the, the, Mughal, uh, the Yeah, the, the invaders, occupiers. Yeah, yeah. On the subject population. Yes. And here we have a Hindu king levying a tax on his subjects because he says, I have to defend you from the, Turks, the Turushk. And so, we all have to do it together. Mm. So, this has been described as a tax without parallel in Indian history I and see. maybe even in world history. I see. Because, you know, I mean, how many of us know that, you know, and there is a tendency, I think it is a, a result of what the British taught us and what the, their successor uh, historians yeah. taught us that, you know, your kings, the Hindu kings were, you know, uh, the most unflattery, flattering language has been used. They were debauched, they were uh, exploiting their population. But actually, this whole downgrading of Hindu kings has to be revisited. Mm. If you look at the kings of that period, there are very few who were not most enlightened. Oh, I see. Most educated, most enlightened. Mm -hmm. And in this, I'll just make a slight digression. Mm -hmm. In the medieval period, you know, what is most uh, surprising is the large number of dharm nibans that were written. I see. Now, dharm nibans means to do with dharma. Yes. Now, why? And most of the dharm nibans were written either by the kings themselves. Okay. Or sponsored by them, written by ministers at their court. I see. Can you imagine any other country which has a galaxy of rulers of this caliber? <laughs> and, you know, we uh, just accept the colonial interpretation that our rulers were not worth any respect. Mm, they were yes. an absolutely outstanding class. Mm. So, in any case, now the question arises. And just to, about the, those dharma nibans, are they still available somewhere? Yes. Now, to elaborate your so, question. Yeah. First of all, why was there a need to write dharma nibans in mm. the medieval period? Yeah. Because we are facing so many problems. Because dharma is under attack. So, dharma is under attack. Yes. So, people have to be reminded of their dharma. Mm. So, dharma nibans. Okay. So, you know, uh, one thing that uh, reading history teaches me hmm. is to uh, do away the, with all the blinkers. Indeed, yes. And, <laughs> and you know, look at your past uh, with admiration. Yes. I'm not saying blind admiration, but it deserves admiration. Recognize the facts. The yes, fact that uh, uh, which country uh, in any in the world hmm. sponsored Dharm Nibans, the kings wrote many of them hmm. to say that, you know, you have to remember your dharma. Incredible. So, it is incredible. Yes. So, Govind Chandra levies this tax. Yes. Now, we were talking about Dharm Nibans. Yes. So, the first Dharm Niband is actually written by a minister in Govind Chandra's court. Okay. Lakshmi Dhar. Okay. So, he writes a Dharm Niband and you know, uh, scholars of the stature of P.V. Kane and all, they have said that it is a remarkable piece of work and it became the model for subsequent writers to follow. Okay. So, it became a standard. Mm -hmm. So, imagine uh, the king is levying a tax, Turush done, his minister is writing a dharm nibandh. Uh -huh. What a glorious period must have been. Indeed. And uh, of course, uh, you know, his wife, Govind Chandra's wife, she uh, sponsored a Buddhist vihara in Sarnath, which had, uh, you know, uh, suffered damage. Mm. So, that inscription of hers that I am restoring the... So, you know, look at the wives are so enlightened. And, and some people would say that Hinduism and Buddhism have been at odds. Well, Imagine. Well, take a look at this. Then. Take a look at this. So, there the you. wife is, and that inscription mm. has survived. Mm, okay. Now, the other thing that is very interesting about the Gahadwala inscriptions mm. is that many of them refer to the kings defeating Hamira. Hamira. Hamira is the enemy Amir. from outside. 
Okay. So, you know, the foreign invader. Okay. So, uh, uh, this uh, um, Govind Chandra's wife's inscription that has been found in Sarnath, huh. it also says that, you know, he defeated the invaders. Mm -hmm. So, it is not just a question that you are uh, aware of your political responsibilities mm. of protecting your subjects. You are aware of your dharmic responsibilities in sponsoring dharm nibans. Mm. And you are also conscious that you have to document it. Mm. So, so many inscriptions of that period have survived mm. which talk about them defeating the invaders. Mm -hmm. So, it is a very, very glorious period. Mm. Unfortunately, so for about uh, for about a hundred years, uh -huh. uh, the Ghadwals were able to stop the advance. Okay, you know there were other people, of course, like the Pratiharas, mm -hmm. but uh, there was no attack for almost a uh, hundred years. Okay, and then the attacks resume under Muhammad Gori. Gori, yes. The the first ones were the, by the Ghaznavids. Ghaznavids. Um, led by Mahmud Ghaznavi mm -hmm. and the second devastating assaults were by Muhammad Ghori. Okay. And that is when the last Gahadwala king is killed. Okay. So, that is the end of the dynasty. That is the end of the dynasty okay. uh, by Muhammad Ghori. Okay. So, that is the end of the dynasty in the sense they survive in some places as feudal lords but okay. the grandeur of the Gahadwals is over. Okay. Now, uh, you know, uh, after that, mm. uh, what do I say about Kashi? Uh -huh. Except that it is a tale of devastation, devastation and devastation yet again. Okay. So, uh, uh, the first round of absolutely lethal assaults is led by Kutubuddin Ebak's general uh, sorry, Muhammad Ghori's general Kutubuddin Ebak, okay. who later becomes the first Sultan of Delhi. Yes. So, in the attack on Kashi, the Persian historians who accompany him write that he destroyed 1000 temples. 1000 temples. So, imagine that that figure should make us visualize what Kashi was. What would have looked like yes. before this happened. Yeah. So, 1000 temples means that every nook and corner had temples. Mm. So, uh, that happens. Uh, he takes away uh, the booty. But again, I am emphasizing that uh, money was not the motive. Because if money was the motive, if we accept it for a moment, uh -huh. then all the wealth had been taken away in the first round. Why of, expend so much energy breaking stuff? No, apart from that, <laughs> that's another question. <laughs> very valid question. Mm. But I'm saying if you've taken away all the wealth and as you say, destroyed the first the round, temples, it was all taken out. Yeah. Yes. And the people rebuild those temples mm. again and again. Yeah. So, in the rebuilt temples, there was no wealth. Indeed, because that takes generations to create the wealth. And, and the rebuilt temples, <clears throat> were very modest structures. Okay. They were not the grand structures that were and in many places, uh, you know, the demolished temples, hmm. their parts were used to rebuild temples. Rebuild, okay. So, there was no wealth left in them. Hmm. Uh, so, but it went on getting attacked and hmm. a, attacked and attacked. So, it is an attack on the culture, the religion itself, dharma itself. Yeah, yes. it is an attack on dharma, that yes. is the way you have put it and that is exactly what it was. Okay. So, uh, there is nothing left. Mm -hmm. But uh, what is uh, absolutely surprising is that, you know, worship continues somehow or the other. Okay. And temples can it continue to be rebuilt. Okay. I will just give examples of uh, some temples. Uh, the Bindu Madhav temple, it was a Vishnu temple. It had been destroyed many times and rebuilt many times. Again, I said as modest structures. Okay. Uh, but in the time of Akbar, uh, it was built or let me say rebuilt for the last time mm -hmm. by a mansabdar of Akbar that is Man Singh. Man Singh. So, Man Singh built the Bindu Madhav temple. It was the grandest temple on the Ganga front. Okay. 
and you know uh, uh, foreign travelers like uh, tavernier bernier uh, they had come and tavernier has a long long description of the temple the you know the schools that were attached to it the okay. the um, uh, you know the sculpture and everything it was a very very grand temple hmm. and he said you know it is at par with jagannath temple oh, because tavernier had gone to all parts of india uh -huh. so this is the temple that was rebuilt by man singh okay and last time it was rebuilt then it was destroyed by the great aurangzeb yes uh, but you know uh, the image of bindu madhav mm -hmm. was taken and hidden in the house of a devotee okay so it remained in that house of the devotee mm. for a very long time okay and at some point because you know the hindus had a tendency that they don't want to surrender the site yeah but if the site has been occupied yes by a mosque or mm -hmm. a eidga mm -hmm. then they will build as close as possible yes yeah. so today if you go to kashi and you say that you want to see the bindu madhav temple uh -huh. it's just behind the mosque of aurangzeb it's a small gully lane okay, okay. you climb up a building go to the first floor and there is one room that is bindu madhav so a temple that was the grandest temple on the ganga river front is now reduced to a small room on the first floor of a building so i haven't been to varanasi thus far you yeah. are you saying there is a mosque where the temple is yes it's still standing there okay so i'll give you some other examples omkara okay it was among the largest temples in kashi okay it occupied an entire hillock an entire hillock hmm and then it was demolished and that whole area hmm uh you know graves it became a graveyard a graveyard a grave and those graves are still there and in the 18th century rani bhavani of bengal hmm she built a small omkar temple it is the size of a jhuggi i can say okay just one room hmm and uh, the pujari does the worship over there hmm. but now you know uh, most uh, devotees are reluctant to go because it's a site where the graves mm. and it's a non hindu population okay so they hardly go there so this is the way you know uh, a very very important krishna site okay. vishnu site uh -huh. arka kund okay and a life size image of vishnu has been found there okay now it's in bharat kala museum okay. where krishna is lifting govardhan i see life size so you life can size. imagine what the temple was like hmm. and that entire place has again been converted into a graveyard and given the name bakaria kund so you know see there are religious wars which are there in other countries also i'm sure but this kind of mocking yes uh, you know uh, fighting is very different from mocking yes and you tend to consciously humiliate yes yes and in the most uh, you know in a way that the other person is rendered actually helpless hmm. you know if you uh, have graves at the site of a temple yes. then how the person who has been grieved is not going to uproot those graves no hmm obviously yes because that doesn't come naturally to hindus in any case mm -hmm. so the graves are there that grand temple is reduced to one small room mm. and now even the devotees feel scared of going and the temp but uh, the, the thing is that even if a temple is lost 5 600 years later somebody will come and build so the memory endures you memory are aware that this is the the site yeah, now. this temple was so now uh, we should now go to uh, gyan bapi all right okay so now uh, the first uh, 
uh, Vishwanath temple hmm. uh, was actually destroyed by Kutubuddin Aibak. Okay. Uh, after that, uh, Queen Razia mm -hmm. uh, ruled for four years. Yes. And you know what a turbulent time she had. Very much, very much. The nobles were all the time trying to uh, dethrone her or kill her. Yes. But in those four years, she found time mm -hmm. to construct a mosque at the site of the first Vishwanath temple. Okay. Well, great achievement. Uh -huh. So, mm. so that mosque still stands. Mm -hmm. I mean, you go to Kashi, you will see that mosque. Mm -hmm. So, that site was closed. Okay. So, obviously, the temple could not be rebuilt there, na? because the mosque was not going to be demolished. Hmm. To reclaim that site. That's mm. not a Hindu uh, trait. Yes. Except for one exception. For one exception. Yes. Yeah, and that also exceptional circumstances. Mm. So, uh, this was destroyed by Kutubuddin Ehbag mm -hmm. in 1196 or something. Mm. Queen Razia builds the mosque in the early uh, 13th century. As a kid, I watched a movie about Razia. Yeah. And and she was such a nice lady. Yes. <laughs> Now, the point is, I'm sure there are going to be movies made showing that <laughs> Aurangzeb was a great Sufi. People have started arguing. Okay. Yes, that he was a great Sufi. Okay. So, you know, I Hema mean. Malini was Razia. But you know, the <laughs> thing is, I mean, that's. <laughs> don't tell me this. I don't want to remember that. Yeah. But I never saw the movie, mercifully. Okay. But, I mean. There is one class of Indians that is like that. Yes. And yes. there is another class that is going on. Mm. So now, this temple was uh, destroyed. I can't help now. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> no. But then, mm. uh, the king, the Raja of Jaipur, mm. in the 17th century, mm -hmm. he builds a Vishwanath temple mm. just behind Razia Mosque. Is the Razia Mosque still there? Yeah, very it's much. There. It's It's... In use, bhai. Okay. Namaz is offered there. I see. But I'm saying that five, six hundred years later, okay. a king from Rajasthan hmm. comes and says that, you know, that was the site of the first original Vishwanath temple. Hmm. So, I cannot destroy that temple. So, I'll build as close as possible. Okay. So, and that uh, a temple that uh, Jai Singh builds, hmm. From outside, you cannot make out that it's a temple. Okay. Because that fear that, you know, uh, the rulers get upset at any... Grandeur, any grand depiction of Hinduism. No, no any murtis. Any murtis. Murtis so, is the thing. Okay. Yeah. So, it looks like a mosque from outside. Oh, okay. So, uh, what I'm just saying is that a site that we had lost, we still remembered that we had lost that site. And we have to build as close as possible mm -hmm. to that site. Okay. So, that is, again, I marvel at the Hindu sense of history. Mm -hmm. Though we were all taught as kids that, you know, Hindus had no sense of history. But the way they remember their history, mm -hmm. it is absolutely. And they are doing this at a time when political power is not in their hands. Yes. You know. So, who was ruling the Varanasi at the time? When, so, when uh, this this temple is built. So now we no, we will just come to this is a Mughal rule now. Okay, it's Mughal rule. Yeah. Okay. So uh, now we leave that Razia Mosque. Okay. And Jai Singh has built the mosque. Okay. Now according, uh, so you know, uh, then what happens is that uh, in uh, uh, no we have uh, Jai Singh has built that mosque. Now we come to what is happening to Vishwanath temple? Where is it built? Where does it go? Mm -hmm. After Razia has demolished, uh, built that thing, yeah. uh, Jai Singh has not come into the picture. Okay, not yet. So, because, mm -hmm. so now uh, when uh, that uh, Vishwanath is shifted uh, to a temple nearby, mm -hmm. Avamukteshwar temple, okay. and place is made for him over there. Okay. And then, at some point, they say, let's build a proper temple. Okay. The temple is built. That is also destroyed. It's also destroyed. Yes. So, uh, there are this, you know, it goes on and on. Now, uh, what happens is that when in the time of Akbar, Man Singh builds the Bindu Madhav temple. Yes. At that time, 
Narayan Bhatt and Todar Mal. Mm -hmm. Todar Mal is the revenue minister and Narayan Bhatt is the... Now I have to take a uh, stop over here. Okay. Uh, because uh, I'll come back to this, you remind me. Okay. We have to come back to Todar Mal and Narayan Bhatt. Okay. Now, uh, we were discussing the turbulence of that period hmm. and how the Hindus still, you know, survived and they remain true to their tradition. Okay. So, what is one of the most remarkable events in the 16th century hmm. is that around six Maharashtrian Brahmin families, hmm. they relocate from the Deccan and they come to Kashi. Okay. Now, we have to remember that there was no king waiting to welcome them. Hmm. And they must have suffered a lot of hardship to relocate from the Deccan to come to Kashi. Yes. But they come because they realize that we cannot surrender the spiritual center of Hinduism. Okay. Even if we don't have political power, even if we have lost the temples, mm -hmm. but we have to keep Kashi as the center of, as one of the important centers of Hindu spiritual traditions. Okay. So these six families migrate in the medieval period. Okay. And the contribution of each one of them is absolutely remarkable. Okay. I cannot give, go into all of them, mm -hmm. but I will discuss one family okay. that is the Bhatta family. Bhatta family. And that Bhatta family has a series of very enlightened, learned, educated members. Okay. Uh, I will uh, concern myself with Narayan Bhatt, whom I just mentioned. Yes. Because Narayan Bhatt, uh, he wrote a text mm -hmm. And uh, in which, you know, first he says that there is no link when you come. He telling the worshippers, when you come, if there is no link, what will you do? Mm -hmm. You imagine there is a link and still do the circumambulation Parabha. around that, etc. Yes. Now, uh, Narayan Bhatt, he uh, meets Todar Mal, who was uh, a revenue minister. Mm -hmm. And he says that, you know, we will rebuild the Vishwanath temple. Okay. So they agree and Akbar uh, was in that sense uh, very different from the Aurang rest of Zeb. them. Aurangzeb, yes. Yes. <clears throat> uh, rest of them we can discuss because Shah Jahan, Jangir, I think we also need to discuss. Yeah, okay. So, uh, but in Akbar's time, uh, in all fairness to him, uh, the Hindus did get a sense of respite. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, Raja Man Singh builds the Bindu Madhav temple mm -hmm. and these people, they say we will build the, rebuild the Vishwanath temple. Vishwanath. Now, where will they build it? Okay. So, uh, there was a historian, uh, A.S. Altikar. Mm -hmm. He was a historian of ancient Indian history at Banaras Hindu University. Okay. So, he wrote a book, uh, History of Banaras. And he says that when Todar Mal and Narayan Bhatt decided to rebuild the temple. They went to the site where a Vishwanath temple stood, which had been built in the 13th, 14th century, okay. which was destroyed okay. by Sikandar Lodhi. By Sikandar Lodhi? Yeah. Okay. So, according to Altekar, a temple site is always a temple site. Hmm. And Narayan Bhatt and Todar Mal said, you know, the sentiments of so many people who came and revered at those sites, those empty shrines, they are calling out for worshippers. Mm. And we cannot abandon this. So, we will build our Vishwanath temple at the site of the temple which was destroyed by Sikandar Lodhi in the 14th century, okay. 15th century. Okay. So, like in Ayodhya, a mm. 10th century temple was destroyed a 12th century temple was built on that temple, mm -hmm. which Babar destroyed. Yes. So, it's that same history over here. Mm -hmm. So, uh, they rebuilt the Vishwanath temple at that site. Okay. So, that is another important uh, aspect of uh, Kashi in the time of Akbar. The two important temples are rebuilt, Bindu Madhav and Vishwanath, Vishwanath temple. Yes. Uh, now, uh, I want to continue the history of this Bhatta family. Of course. Now, this Bhatta family, first of all, look at the contribution to visualize that mm. we have to reconstruct. What yes. was that? There was no urgency for them to do it. There was no need. They could have just 
lived out their life without getting into all this. But to plan out the construction, mm. to decide the site, mm. to execute that plan and to have that temple constructed was so not a small achievement. And the ra to raise the money as well. Yes. Yes. Uh, then uh, the other and contribution of this family hmm. is Narayan Bhatt's great grandson. Uh -huh. The other members are also very very distinguished, but hmm. I am cutting the story short okay. and coming to great grandson Gaga hmm. Bhatt. Okay. Gaga Bhatt lived in the time of Aurangzeb, okay. like Narayan Bhatt lived in the time of uh, Akbar. Akbar. Narayan Bhatt's grandson lived in the time of Aurangzeb, and he was in Kashi. Okay. At that time, Shivaji was. Es has escaped from uh, Aurangzeb's prison yes. and was en route to the Deccan. On his way back. So he met, according to the story, he met Gaga Bhatt okay. at Kashi and these people arranged for his safe passage to the Deccan. Okay. Now, uh, sometime after that, Gaga Bhatt uh, went to Patan to, pray, uh, pray, you know, to offer homage at his uh, Ma Bhavani temple. Okay. And then he went to Raigarh uh -huh. and uh, there he met Shivaji mm. and uh, you know uh, Shivaji had declared that Hindvi Swaraj yes. was his objective. Yes. Uh, so Gaga Bhatt says that you know you have to be coronated as per Vedic rites because no coronation of a Hindu king had been done as per Vedic rites for God knows how long. Yes. So he says I'll go back, mm. prepare, consult the ancient texts, mm. prepare the procedure, then he goes back prepares the procedure, that procedure for the coronation of a Hindu king as per Vedic rituals has, is available to us. It has survived and is available to us even today. Okay. And Gagabhat goes and presides over that coronation mm. and Shivaji is Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj. Maharaj yes. So that is, mm. look at this family. Mm. And to just to bring you up to date, 2024. Okay. A, Grandson, great grandson, I don't know how, what. From the same lineage. From the same lineage, hmm. was presiding over the pran Prana pratishtha hmm. of the temple at Ayodhya. Awesome. So, Amazing. you know, hmm. so you know uh, the traditional intelligentsia hmm. of India, actually, they just fought with nothing at their disposal. Hmm. They lived a life of frugality, hmm. of poverty. And I mean, they kept these traditions alive. It is amazing how they did it. Mm. And you know, we uh, we are so contemptuous that we uh, you know, pandit hai, whatever it is we uh -huh. use that they don't know anything. Uh -huh. They are the ones who kept this tradition alive. Yes. I mean, what was the incentive for? They were not getting paid anything. Yes. They were risking their lives. Yes. And uh, still they. They built, rebuilt temples in the heyday of Muslim Mughal power. Yes. And they actually went and coronated Shivaji. Yes. What more can you expect? What more can you ask for? Yeah, what yeah. more can you ask for? Yes. So it's amazing. The, uh, one more thing about this uh, traditional intelligentsia at Kashi. Mm -hmm. You know, the traditional intelligentsia is very different from those people who became Mughal Mansabdars. Mm. But we have to remember also that those people who became Mughal Mansabdars, let me say for example, the Rajputs who became Mughal Mansabdars. Mm -hmm. It's not that the Rajputs who became Mughal Mansabdars surrendered their traditional heritage mm -hmm. and just became lackeys of the Mughals. Mm -hmm. No. Mm -hmm. They were very conscious that they have to be true to their heritage in the Altered circumstances. In the altered circumstances, where there is no choice actually. Well, uh, so they have to earn a living or they have to survive, otherwise they can be killed by the... Yeah. So, you know, uh, what most of these Rajput Mansabdas did, that in their courts, in their home kingdoms, they got histories written about their families. Okay. <laughs> and those histories were just diametrically opposite to what the Mughal Darbaris were writing. Okay. And so they write that, you know, uh, we are still as powerful as we were in our own kingdom. Hmm. Akbar may be powerful in his kingdom, but we are. And they, uh, you know, I mean, they're very conscious that history will judge us harshly. Hmm. They were conscious of that. 
Yes. Mm. And uh, so they get histories written like Man Singh. He gets a uh, history written. He does not mention that his grandfather gave a daughter in marriage to mm. Akbar. They mm. don't mention these alliances. Mm. So, you know, they are conscious that it's a uh, difficult. So, that is for the Rajput Mansabdars. Uh, we should not uh, uh, underestimate mm. their uh, difficult situation mm. and how they try to preserve what they could in the best of times. As best they could. As best they could. And mm. Jaising built, rebuilt that Kashi temple, mm -hmm. the you know, the Vishwanath, Vishwanath temple. temple. Yeah. And according to some maps that have survived, mm. actually he was trying, he got plans made to reconstruct the Gyanvapi temple and was purchasing land. Okay. So, you know, I mean, by and large, I would say that Indians, if I can use that word, yes. I don't know what else word to use. Mm -hmm. uh, the way they remained committed, dedicated to their civilizational heritage mm. is something that really deserves to be acknowledged mm, you know. now. Mm. Because, you know, we have, we, we have been taught a history where this doesn't count. Yes. Now, last uh, example that I want to give of a traditional intelligence here, mm -hmm. uh, at Kashi, mm -hmm was a person, Kabindacharya. Okay. Uh, they, these people were all great Sanskrit scholars. Okay. So, he was a very great Sanskrit scholar and uh, he actually uh, persuaded Shah Jahan hmm. to stop levying the pilgrimage tax to Hindus who were going to Prayag, etc. Okay. Now, if Akbar had abolished the pilgrimage tax, why was he why did this fellow have to ask? Mm -hmm. So, we, it's a question that has to be answered and studied. Mm. Maybe the uh, Mughal officers were not following the imperial orders. Okay, the emperor is far away. He, he doesn't know. <laughs> <laughs> what I, I mean, that question remains to be answered. Okay. So, he goes and he uh, persuades Shah Jahan uh -huh. to abolish the pilgrimage tax. But this fact that Shah Jahan abolished the pilgrimage tax is not mentioned in any Persian history. Okay. <laughs> because, so, how do we know it? So, because first of all, Shah Jahan very conscious that his image as a good Muslim ruler uh -huh. should not be damaged. It should not be tarnished. Yes. <laughs> so, oh. now, Kavindacharya, when he comes back to Banaras, hmm. he gets hundreds of felicitation letters from Hindus all over. Okay. <laughs> that, you know, what a great thing and we are indebted to you and all. Those letters have been preserved. Okay. So, we have those. Those. Okay. So, uh, I mean, you know, uh, for the medieval period, mm. I think that we have to remember that it was a very contested kind of situation. Mm. It's not a one-way victory for anyone. Okay. Even though the Mughal state was so powerful, yes. to imagine that it had ridden roughshod over everyone is not at all true. And the example of the traditional intelligentsia, mm. which had nothing, no money, no might, yes. no office, mm. no position. Yes. And, uh, you know, being true to their heritage in those circumstances and actually emerging victorious in so many situations. Mm -hmm. That is something uh, that has to be, uh, you know, remembered with gratitude. Yes. Now, to cut the long story short, uh, this temple that was built by Todarmal and Narayan Bhatt, we yes. know it was uh, destroyed on the orders of Aurangzeb. Aurangzeb. Now, some people lately have said that it was not destroyed, it was not Aurangzeb. But the point is that the Farman has been preserved in Masere Alamgiri, okay. and uh, which is a Persian uh, thing that was written in the time of Aurangzeb. Yes. And it also adds that on completion of the task, it was reported to the emperor okay. that it has been done. Okay. So, uh, there is no dispute about it. Black and white. Sorry. Black and white. Yeah. Now, uh, it seems Hmm. That at some point, uh, some Kashi temple was reconstructed. Okay. Because in 1755, that Kashi temple which was reconstructed is destroyed, and the Hindus they go on Hartal. Okay. So, it was destroyed on the orders of some rabid cleric. A cleric? You okay. can understand. Uh -huh. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
and then there's a uh, you know hartal etc okay and so that is on record that the temple of vishwanath was destroyed in 1755 okay okay, okay. we don't know much about what happened after that but okay. we know that there was a strike and the shopkeepers went on hartal etc okay now uh, we have to now uh, come to there is one incident that takes place in 1809 hmm it's a bloody conflict uh, around gyanwapi okay uh, between the hindu side and the muslim side let me put it that way okay and it lasts for 3 days hmm only but in those 3 days it was very very intense and uh, the gosai group or the hindu group uh, they almost burned down the gyanwapi the mosque the mosque okay and uh, then what happens is that uh, the magistrate the british magistrate uh, mr watson mm -hmm. he says that you know uh, this area is a area of tension mm -hmm. and the muslims are attached to this side mm -hmm. to this side the side only because it marks their ascendancy over the hindus over the natives over the natives okay it's not that they have any uh, particular attraction to this site only because it marks their ascendancy okay and he says that you know this there'll be constant uh trouble and tension so i suggest that you exclude one community from this area let the muslims only offer namaz inside the mosque and nowhere else okay the rest it should be left open to the hindus to come and go whatever okay. so that was not uh, implemented because the other officials said that you know uh, the muslim the british policies of neutrality mm -hmm. so let it we are not going to take side from one side or the other okay in any case this is the story uh, that stops there now with the uh, decline of the mughal empire uh, we have two important players coming into the scene mm -hmm. can it continue please do okay so uh, i will first talk about the marathas okay and then i will talk about the rajas of banaras okay and then we will stop this over here okay so in the 18th century we find the marathas becoming an ascendant power yes and moving outside the deccan and mm. spreading and coming up till north india yes and uh, the you see what happened was that uh, shivaji's grandson shahu mm -hmm. had been taken prisoner by aurangzeb who when he was young i think seven or some such thing mm -hmm. and aurangzeb had decided that the best way to disarm him mm -hmm. or the maratha movement is to bring him up as in the mughal camp as a mughal prince mm -hmm. so he is decultured yes but it is remarkable that shahu who spent so many years in the mughal camp and saw all the persian ways mm. when he goes back he at once attunes himself to the maratha tradition okay and he says that now you know he's so wise for his age mm. he says i will uh, the ruling i mean the actual work of administration will be handed over to the peshwas mm. so with the peshwas a new phase in the maratha history commences yes so the maratha the uh, uh, balaji vishwanath he comes to delhi with 16000 forces mm. force of 16000 tells the mughal emperor uh, release shahu's mother was been in captivity for 18 years okay and you recognize us as the de facto power in the deccan mm -hmm. and you know we will look after you whatever we can do to protect you we will protect you so imagine this community of marathas mm -hmm. what a community and what service they have done to this terrible phase of our history how they have stood yes you know yes. and at what cost mm -hmm. so in any case the peshwas uh, you know they ascend becomes uh, very they become very powerful mm -hmm. and we have uh, many of these peshwas 
coming to North India, negotiating with the Mughal emperor, mm. etc. Now, uh, what is very surprising, not surprising, what is very remarkable mm. is that the Maratha, the Peshwas, mm. they want to recover Kashi. Okay. Kashi, Prayag, all these are coming under the Avad Nawabs because it's in present day UP. Yes. So, the Avad Nawabs are actually Shias. Okay. And the dominant trend in the Mughal court was of Sunnis. Indeed. So, they were all the time, you know. At odds. At odds. Yes. And they were many times seeking Maratha help against the Sunni okay. group. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, they are not. Uh, so, many of these Maratha leaders, Holkar, they say that we, there's a letter of Holkar's which has survived, which I've. Uh, so, he says that, you know, uh, he has decided he is going to demolish Gyan Bapi. And the Brahmins in that area are very scared because they, they know the amount of power the Muslims still have. Okay. And you know what they can do to them. Mm -hmm. So, these negotiations go on. Then the Pesh, uh, then Peshwa writes to his commanders in Delhi that, you know, if the Avad Nabab is not going to give us three, for Kashi, we tell him we will pay 50 lakhs, we will make him the Mughal Wazir. So, all these intense negotiations and they show the Marathas in such positive light. I see. You know, sitting in the Deccan, mm. from there hoping to capture these holy cities. Mm. Then, you know, uh, the two invasions take place which really cripple them in a way. Mm. The invasion of Nadir Shah, Nadir Shah and then the invasion of Ahmad Shah Abdali. Mm. And uh, before the final battle of Panipat, mm -hmm. the Marathas actually threw out Abdali's son from Lahore. Okay. So, you know, when that news reaches the okay. south, mm -hmm. that Abdali's son has been thrown out of Lahore, mm -hmm. there is Diwali celebrated, you know, Atak to Katak. Oh, I see, Atak to Katak. <laughs> you know, so the Marathas mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, it's Diwali and it's such celebrations. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, it ends with the absolute uh, rout of the Marathas hmm. in the third battle of Panipat. Panipat. But again, what a doughty race. Yes. Within a decade of the rout at Panipat, hmm. in which they lost an entire generation, hmm. including the Peshwa's son was also killed. Hmm. So, a new breed of or a new generation of Marathas comes to the fore. Hmm. And they include people like Ahilya Bai Holkar. Oh, yes, indeed. And Mahaji Sindhya. Mahaji Sindhya. And Mahaji Sindhya, he writes to the Peshwa mm. that, you know, now the British are fighting Tipu. Mm. We should not extend any help to them mm. until they commit to us that they will help us to rebuild the Gyan Vapi at its original site. I see. So imagine, mm. I mean, this. Civilizational awareness, mm -hmm. how marked it was mm -hmm. across generations. Yes. So, in any case, uh, that is, and three Maratha royal ladies visit Kashi in this turbulent period. I see. You know, uh, the Peshwa's mother, the Peshwa's wife, the widow of a young uh, member of the family, mm -hmm. they actually come on Tirth to Kashi. Mm -hmm. In these turbulent times. So, you know how much it meant to them. They could have very well sat in their homes. Yes. In comfort. Yes. But they undertook that journey. That in that troubled times. Mm -hmm. And the third visit by a royal lady was almost at the time when Amacha was. Had begun his attacks on India. Okay. So, you can imagine. Mm -hmm. So, now uh, the last uh, phase that I would like to discuss. Is that, you know. Uh. When the Mughal Empire was in decline, mm -hmm. uh, then we have the rise of the Maharajas of Banaras. Of Banaras, okay. The Maharajas of Banaras are very different from the Marathas. Uh -huh. They are a family. Uh, you know, uh, they began as, uh, what you say, revenue collectors. Okay. And then they become de facto rulers. Okay. And this is an area which has a strong Mughalizing influence, uh -huh. you know. So, it was very possible that if it was not for the Mara Maharajas or Banaras, Banaras would have been a Mughalizing city as so many other cities mm -hmm. of North India. Mm -hmm. But the Maharajas 
and they actually lose power, effective power to the East India Company, mm -hmm. but they remain uh, de facto. I mean, they remain on their throne, but the political power is taken. Yes. But they preside over a tremendous cultural renaissance. Okay. So, you know, imagine so many parts of India are reconnecting. Mm. They never lost touch in any case, but in a major positive way, mm. they are reconnecting. Okay. So, the Maharajas of Banaras, the cultural renaissance that Banaras sees as a result of their patronage, mm -hmm. you know, they sponsor Ramayan Kavyas, Ramayan texts, Ramayan Braj poetry, music. I see. And they, most important, they start the Ram Leela enactment for 30 days in Banaras. Okay, that tradition starts there. They start this tradition. Okay. So, uh, you know, it is, I mean, I'll only end by saying that uh, India has seen such turbulent times, hmm. such difficult times, which have destroyed so many civilizations outside India. Yes, indeed. Uh, India suffered a tremendous amount mm -hmm. of violence and devastation. Yes. But through all these dark times, mm. people of India, mm. they never wavered in their commitment to their civilizational heritage. Yes. Whether you talk about the traditional intelligentsia, whether you talk about ordinary people who rebuilt those small temples, Whoever you talk about, that is why we say India was always a living civilization. Yes. It may have been crippled, mm. which it certainly was. Yes. But it did not allow itself to die. Yes. And crippling, 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 it regained its strength slowly but gradually. Mm. And today as a proud Hindu, as a proud India, Indian, I bow my head to my ancestors and to the amazing fortitude, courage they showed. I cannot even imagine any one of us being in that situation yes. and acting the way they did. So, yes. I'd like to uh, close this narrative on expressing gratitude for being born in this country, inheritor of a great civilization and to my ancestors who never wavered. Indeed. Thank you so much. So that was the conversation. Hope you liked it. If you enjoyed this, please share this on WhatsApp and other media. Thank you very much and I'll see you soon.